whom Karl Marx could say could certainly be counted as an important leader. Karl Hess, who had much more uh, amiable and much more sentimental temperament than Marx, doesn't say anything of this kind. He continues to remember his grandfather's lessons. He bears no resentment or hatred towards the Jews, even at this early period, as we shall see. All he says is that really the, the, the Jews are now something of a historical anomaly. Surely, even if they cannot baptize themselves, they can at least offer baptism to their children. And by judicious and quiet intermarriage with the populations around them, they can peacefully, slowly dissolve in a dignified manner and thus to cease to the problem troubling the faithful of mankind. Well, this was an absolute commonplace which both Protestant theologians and assimilated and baptized Jews were at that time preaching. The only thing which is slightly, um, 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 which is slightly inconsistent with this attitude is what occurred in 1840, which is a notable year in his life. In 1840, there was a famous Damascus case, about which people here may or may not know. The Damascus case was one of the regular cases of the accusation of famous blood libel, the famous accusation of ritual murder by the Jews in the city of Damascus, which caused an immense fuss, which afterwards a mission headed by Moses Montefiore from England and Adolf Cremio from France managed to um, assuage, they managed to, to, to do something to improve the position of the Jews in Syria at that time. Hess was deeply affected by this, but, and felt, suddenly felt violent Jewish sentiment surging in his breast, so he tells us later. But, he said to himself, the sufferings of the proletariat are more important than the sufferings of the Jews. Justice for the Jews is an important issue, but justice for the workers is a greater issue. And so he declares that he simply suppressed this feeling in himself, eliminated it, and applied himself to the greater, nobler task of securing emancipation for all mankind, which would automatically bring about that of the Jews too. In eight, the same year, 1840, there was a great uh, surge of patriotic feeling in Germany, Francophone feeling. And the famous Wacht am Rhein was written by a man called Becker. Well, Hess, which you, uh, as you may now imagine, was a man easily, who easily floated on high currents of sudden feeling. He was not a very equable figure, but liable to strong emotional storms. Suddenly felt himself patriotic German and decided to set these words to music. And so he set the Wacht am Rhein to music. I think the words are, we sollen ihn nicht haben den freien deutschen Rhein. He set the words to music and sent it to the author. He received a polite, well, cold letter from the author in his own handwriting, but on the back of the envelope, in a disguised hand, the author suddenly produced a small anti-Semitic scribble, saying, Sie sind ein Jid. This shook Hess. He really had an agonizing moment when he thought that Becker had insulted him and deliberately insulted him, which turned out to be the case. And he tells us in his memoirs later that this is the thing which began a process which was destined to have lasting effect upon him. He began saying to himself that perhaps Becker was right, that although the Jews were in some sense not Germans, the Jews in some sense were a race and a people in themselves, and that although it was not the fact that the difference of race justified one member of one race in insulting the members of another, yet in a way Becker was right. He had no right suddenly to pose as a 100% tutor maniac, as they were called, 100% German patriot, when in fact he really belonged to quite a different dispensation. In fact, he wrote a letter to Becker to that effect at some later stage. But this was still very early. We are still in 1840-41. Well, in the 40s, he was a typical young Hegelian radical. He believed in socialism, and in 41, he met Karl Marx. He, the effect of his meeting with Karl Marx, I think, is that he probably, I don't say that he converted him to full fledged communism, he converted Engels. Engels tells us in one of the early night papers, in the early 40s, that he was in fact converted to communism by Moses Hess, who was the first German communist. First full-fledged, 100% German communist on German soil. And therefore had a considerable influence, I must say, he has much to be responsible for. As for Karl Marx, Karl Marx, I think, was drifting in that direction already, but apparently Hess's fervid sermons did make some impression upon him. Hess was absolutely enchanted by Marx. He thought he was the most marvelous human being whom he'd ever, ever met. I think perhaps that I could find a passage for in which he describes Karl Marx at this, uh, this particular period. You will see a certain impression which Marx made upon him. He says about Marx, he is the greatest, perhaps the only true philosopher actually now alive. Dr. Marx, that is the name of my idol, is still a very young man, he is five years younger than himself. 
He is only 24, and will strike the final death blow of medieval religion and politics. He combines philosophical depth with the most biting wit. Imagine Rousseau, Voltaire, Holbach, Lessing, Heine, Abel, not thrown together anyhow, but fused into a single magnificent personality, and you have Dr. Marx. <laughs> well, from this we'll judge that he was very liable and was liable to be carried away by feelings, and indeed Marx, when he was 24, no doubt did make a very fine and, 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 and lasting impression upon his disciples. At any rate, I think we may uh, ascribe it to um, Hess that it was his transmission of the doctrines of the French masters which finally administered the coup de grace and pushed Marx over into what ultimately became called the doctrine of socialism and communism. Until then, he was simply a young Hegelian who still worshipped the Hegelian notion of the bureaucratic state as being the ultimate, uh, so to speak, uh, ideal of organized mankind. The anti-state doctrines come really from Hess. Well, in the late 40s, he has wandered about, collaborated with various radical journalists in the Rhineland, went to Paris, was expelled from Paris, went to Brussels, converted Bakunin to some kind of anarchism, which is one of the, so to speak, side moves, so to speak, of this rather extraordinary personality, met Fudo, met Cadet, made friends with them, and generally became one of the band of brothers concerned about the salvation of mankind from the yoke of the priests, the capitalists, the kings, and the forces of darkness in general. I don't think even at this period he could be said to have been a particularly prominent figure in this brotherhood. People liked him very much because he was very nice. But on the whole, his brain was not the equal of that of someone like Marx, or even like someone like, like that of someone like Bakunin, and he was simply thought of as a very nice man who cared deeply for the salvation of mankind and had radical views. Rather like Owen, in a way. 1848, uh, founded in Brussels, helping Engels and Marx write the Communist Manifesto, which he helped them with in 1847. In fact, he collaborated in, in a work called German Ideology with Marx, which were large pieces printed, written by Hess, and equally large pieces denouncing him as an absolutely worthless thinker, all this bound in one volume. It shows something from the tolerance and good nature of Hess. We had no objection to writing a chapter in a book which denigrated him more violently than any other book that has ever been written. It's a curious fact, but apparently a true one. At this period, what Marx had against him, and what he always, all his life had against him, was that Hess was too moral, that his communism, even his socialism, sprang not from the notion that history was inevitable, or that it was the only efficient way of governing mankind, or that it was unavoidable, or that it was a class called the proletariat which could not help, so to speak, winning the historical battle. He simply believed in socialism and communism because he thought they were just. And what he wanted was justice for mankind. His impulse and his motive was moral. And Marx constantly says about Hess, it's a great pity, he talks in the name of general humanity. General humanity is an abstraction. He doesn't understand what it is to belong to a class. And it is perfectly true that Hess, although he recognized the validity of Marx's analysis of class structure, that is to say, he believed that there were entities called economic classes created historically by the developing economic conditions, didn't believe in the inevitability of class war, <coughs> nor did he believe in the inevitability of violence. And all his life he preached the doctrine that if sufficiently violent means were taken, then the purposes which these means were used would not come about, because the violence of the means would create a universe in which these good ends could no longer be realized. And it's difficult to maintain that he was not a better prophet in that respect than Karl Marx himself. <laughs> but one can see why Marx was irritated. He was irritated by a man who constantly quoted the Bible, brought up by a quasi rabbi, who was constantly telling him about the difference between good and bad, when the whole point of the Marxist revolution was to get away from these stale moral categories and preach the revolution in the name of an inevitable process for which we only needed to appeal to men's reason and not their moral feelings. And this gap remained between them to the end of their lives. The revolution of 1848 didn't really crush Hess as much as it did a great many other revolutionaries who had invested all they had in the revolution of 48 and who emerged from it in a state of extreme defeat. Either they crossed over to the enemy or they simply went off into a kind of resentful silence, writing memoirs justifying their own part and blaming everybody else. 